So I want to welcome all of our listeners back uh, to the Untapped podcast. It's been a while since we've connected with many of y'all. Um, uh, when you're, as you're meeting us, you're not only meeting us as an Untapped podcast, but if you if you kind of been following the company's updates, we've also changed our name to Untapped. Um, and so um, it felt right, felt like the right point in time, uh, felt like the right inflection point, um, given the journey the company has been on, where you know, we're always eager to figure out how we can kind of broaden the opportunity landscape and kind of connect with some of the giants in the industry to, to bring about more equity in our space. Um, today, I feel really lucky. Uh, we already have great rapport. We spent about you know three or four minutes connecting before this, but I'm really excited to welcome David to the podcast. We'll make sure that we post David's um, full bio. Um, but they have an incredible story. And so uh, rather than me tell that story, I want to make sure that David can tell that story. And um, David, you know, welcome, first of all. It's good to have you. Thank you so much, Tarek. Very, very excited to be with you today. Yes, me too. Um, and, 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 and I know our listeners are in for a treat. So, David, every time we open this podcast, um, we, we always try to connect with the, the, uh, the, the individual's journey because I think that you'll, you've already, already found this in your journey and certainly in mine, that the path to equity work um, it isn't singular, right? Sometimes it's drawn from our own personal experiences and how we show up in the world, how we perceive ourselves, how, how others perceive us. Um, sometimes it's from academia, sometimes it's from work experience. And so it's really important for our listeners, you know, given the, the, the role that you have and kind of where you are, that we unpack just what brought you here. And so I'll let you take it wherever you want, but I want to know how this work found you. And I think our listeners do as well. So take me through your journey. I'm really excited to hear about it. Yeah, thanks. Um, massive question, um, but I will, I will try to do it service. So I'll start off with just a brief introduction on myself. So David Babala, they then pronouns. I'm an associate partner with McKinsey & Company, which is a large professional services consulting organization and have been with McKinsey for a little over six years. Um, before McKinsey, though, which which gets to sort of the heart of your question, was born and raised in Jamaica, Queens, for people that don't know New York City, um, in, in the 90s. And candidly, some parts of it today are, are still the inner city of New York. So uh, I grew up in a quote unquote rough neighborhood. Um, love it and visit my parents there all the time. But grew up, grew up in Jamaica, Queens, was there for my entire life before I went to high school. Um, it wasn't necessarily the safest place for someone. Um, went to high school in the Bronx, Bronx High School of Science, fantastic institution that truly changed the trajectory of my life. And, and it was an amazing experience. It was also not in the safest neighborhood. Um, graduated high school, went to college, university in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Safer environment, not necessarily the most welcoming for a biracial, queer, gender non-conforming, trans femme individual. So, um, you know, we're at 2015 when I've graduated college and I've come out to no one from a sexual orientation perspective, from a gender identity perspective. And truly the first place where I actually felt safe was at McKinsey. Mm -hmm. I joined McKinsey in 2015 and within the first month of being at the firm, I started telling my colleagues I'm queer and it was yeah. the first time those words ever left my mouth. And so yeah. I think about my journey and I haven't even talked about my time at McKinsey, but for a majority of my life, there was not a safe space for me to be authentically me. And so yeah. to answer your question of how, how I got into this work, I think this work was made for me. Um, mm. just based on, based on myself, my multiple identities, the environments that I was, that I was put in, um, either by fate or by, or by choice. So very excited to, to chat with you a bit more about the work that I do at McKinsey. Yeah. I mean, incredible story. I think one that I can connect with really well, you know, um, also grew up in uh, what would be considered the rough part of Boston. It wasn't really rough for me. I was like, there's a hood everywhere, no matter where you go. So I was cool with it. Um, and um, I, I also managed the complexity of multiple identities, right? How do you manage the complexity of being multiracial, um, you know, experiencing a coming of age in terms of one sexuality that um, probably would have, I think, blossomed sooner 
had I not been in different environments, went to an all boys, you know, Catholic high school in the middle of the city, um, you know, black and Latino family, um, where, um, you know, questions of machismo or masculinity, um, based on, you know, on the, just a large histography of experiences, um, uh, kept me from really actualizing and then didn't really feel like I could really kind of present myself into the world as like this queer biracial man, um, cisgendered man until, um, until co after college and then got to the Bay area. And it was in my first professional setting that I also kind of came out to the world and, and felt like I had a lot of catching up to do and, um, that it was my time to kind of actualize and into, I, into who I was meant to be. But I also kind of carried the complexity of intersectionality with me pretty deeply, right? It's like, here I am understanding how, you know, I present to the world as a cisgendered biracial man, but also understanding that my sexual identity kind of put me in some spaces of harm in other parts of the city, et cetera. So I, I definitely connect to, to that journey with you and also share in how lucky I felt to have my first professional experience be one where who I was in my entirety was fully embraced and how that really sets the direction of my experience downstream. So, so I appreciate that. Let's talk about your work at, at McKinsey because I'm really intrigued by it. I had the opportunity to kind of read um, the report that you had a large influence on and, and, and just appreciate it. Um, let's talk about it. So um, being transgender at work, um, I want to just go through, let's start with the facts, right? Because I think like the facts, the findings are really exciting. Let's set the problem, uh, the problem area so that folks understand. What are some of the top findings that you want to really share with our listeners? Uh, our listeners, you know, across industries, but you can imagine primarily in tech. Um, and so just help me understand kind of what, what we should know about the, the initial findings of this report. Then we'll talk about the kind of the current landscape that we find ourselves in and then eventually move to solutions. But I want to hear from you. Yeah. Bring us through it. And and maybe maybe I can take a step back into into the why before the what. Um, yes. Yes. So, you know, when we think about DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion, um, it's been a hot topic, right? For the right. For especially the last sort of two years, the pandemic, moving to remote work. Uh, multiple racial equity movements across the globe. Mm -hmm. And so a bright spot in some cases, right? There has been progress in DEI more broadly over the last couple of years, more so, but the last couple of decades, which has impacted so many marginalized communities and, and also marginalized right. communities that identify that, like you and I with multiple identities. That hasn't right. necessarily translated into actual improvements for the trans experience in the United States. Right. despite right. long-standing struggle for comprehensive LGBTQ rights, both within the U.S. and, and broadly. Being right. trans today often means not only facing stigma, but also threats to safety, existence, right. whether it's sure. the record high levels of deadly violence or a record number of restrictive proposals, right? Where we've seen news outlet after news outlet, headline after headline talking about what trans individuals can and can't do. Um, there have been a few spotlights, which is great, but most of those efforts have faced a ton of roadblocks. And as I think about DEI um, and the clients that I serve and my friends that work at these corporations and our leaders at these corporations, employers face and focus more on supporting sexual orientation diversity in the workplace than on gender identity um, or gender mm -hmm. expression. And all too mm -hmm. frequently, the trans experience may not even register on the radars of employers, mm -hmm. of management teams, of corporate leaders, when they actually work on DEI efforts. And so the, the why behind this is exactly what I said. We wanted to make sure that there was a space for us to talk about including the trans experience in the corporate workplace. And so wanted to give a, a bit of flavor as to, as to the why, because that was super important to me and the team that actually did this work, if that makes sense. Yeah, let, let, let's, let's stop there. Cause I'm glad that you brought me back a little bit because I think that like, you've, you've touched on this point. I think the report opens on this point, but like, 
this idea, and I think, you know, even when I think back as someone who is like incredibly passionate about racial equity and frankly still is incredibly passionate about racial equity coming from an academic sense and now seeing the real world applications of it, you know, there's always been this politics of representation or this politics of visibility. And I think I love the opening of this report because it, it immediately kind of unpacks that for the reader, which is, you know, visibility doesn't equate to opportunity. That visibility doesn't equate to equity. Visibility doesn't equate to safety. Visibility doesn't equate to justice, right? Um, you know, my mentor used to talk about, you know, what does it mean to have, you know, brown faces in high places on, you know, college brochures, but not necessarily resulting in more equitable out graduation rates or equitable outcomes downstream. And so before we get into the findings, you're right, let's unpack that, right? Like, you know, to, to the tech community, we get really excited, right? Especially in these last couple of years of our tweets that say Black Lives Matter, of our Instagram posts that say stop AAPI hate, of our posts around Trans Day of Remembrance, et cetera. But can, let, can we unpack a little bit like this difference between, you know, holding the truth that visibility is important but also the harm by being able to celebrate trans stories. I think about the how you know uh, we've loved to be able to appropriate trans culture, right? Trans ballroom culture can be fans of Pose, right? But then not even bring ourselves to be proximate to the experiences of trans individuals. And so can we just unpack that, the difference between visibility for a moment and, and the difference between um, that not necessarily equating to opportunity before we get into the findings. I actually think it's a brilliant point that you folks open with. Yeah, and 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 the reality of it is, right, um, and I love everything that you just said, and it, it resonates quite a bit. Um, visibility is important. Representation is important. That's right. Right? Um, but the reality is, representation is 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 just the start, right? Mm -hmm. I, I want to see individuals like me. I want to hear individuals like me but the reality is it, it, there's this huge cycle of right. representation. In order to keep those folks represented, right. we need to make things more equitable. We need to make sure that we are inclusive. And so like what, what I think what a lot of people fail to realize, one, is that all of these things are interlinked and you cannot have one without the other. That's right. And people pretend like, oh, well, we just need to hire 10 more trans folks or... Right. 10 more black trans folks. Right. But if you're shifting nothing about the system mm -hmm. that has precluded them from the start, mm -hmm. you won't keep them. Mm -hmm. And and then I think there's this there's this brilliant um, phrase that I've heard from from someone who's very visible in the DEI community and it's bas it basically states comprehension is not required to be compassionate. Right. And so there is so much complexity around the trans experience that I candidly don't expect someone who isn't going through this to understand every single thing. But that is not required to be compassionate about. I want this person to feel included at work. Mm -hmm. And because that person is included and because we are making experiences and opportunities more equitable, we are going to severely increase representation. And so I think I think that's the foundation of this. But in so many cases, people don't get the foundation. So we don't even get into the super exciting, very pivotal things that need to happen, both in the workplace and in generally, right, um, in, in different sectors outside of the private sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think, you, you, you also get, I'm just going to keep going, you also get into this through your report around, um, around the, the power of language, right? Um, and I, I, you know, even at Untapped, we often talk about the fact that no matter how passionate we are about equity and justice, in the absence of shared language to actually engage the work, um, you know, we're not truly able to start this journey of, of delivering results because um, we're just not on the same page. And so... I do sometimes see um, language as being uh, a barrier to comprehension, right? It's like, if I don't know how to engage this community or talk about this community, what do I do? Um, and so can we just talk about language for a moment and then we'll totally, we'll, then we'll dive into these findings, but I think it's an important um, place to start. So, you know, we use terms like diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, justice, URG, you know, BIPOC, you know, the, the like, right? 
And I sometimes feel as though there, there's two camps, right? There's one camp who feels like, you know, we have to be able to create some um, umbrella terms that, you know, enable us to address kind of the broad stroke needs of a community or the broad stroke identities of a community, in short, rightfully so. Then there's this other camp, right, that says that words like diversity feels better to us, right, especially folks, you know, who find themselves in majority groups so we know our demographics are shifting, um, instead of terms like anti-racism, right, um, et cetera. So we're going to use a lot of, I'm sure we're going to use a lot of language, right, uh, as we talk about the findings here. So let's just talk about and nerd out for a moment why language is so important, because I did like the nuance of, you know, without creating shared language, it's hard for us to actually engage this work. And even within the trans community, there's still some um, some nuance about the terms by which we attach ourselves to to be able to communicate the ways in which we show up in the world. So just take us on the language journey uh, because, you know, I'm on the journey, you're on the journey, we're all on the journey. Let's just talk about it. Yeah, so I love this. Um, and and forgive me for, for nerding out a bit too much, but you'll you'll stop me where you want me to well, stop. Well, keep so, going. I think I think overall, it's like what we're talking about today when we talk DEI more broadly, ESG, corporate social responsibility, purpose, whatever you wanna whatever umbrella term you wanna put it under. Um, in order for anyone to start, it starts with education and awareness, yeah. right? And what, what is linked to that is language. And so yeah. when I think about the trans experience, yeah. and I mentioned this earlier, but it often gets erased or ignored because people simply don't have the vocabulary to talk about it. That's right. Or, and or, they're afraid they're actually going to cause offense by getting the words they do know wrong. And, right. and so in, in many of the conversations with, corporate leaders, with public social sector leaders, um, in order to actually craft policy that's inclusive and mm -hmm. equitable for mm -hmm. trans employees, what's super important, language is one thing, but you also need to understand the fundamental barriers and experience that trans people contend with, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so language is super important, but just fully understanding of, of experience I think is, is very much linked with that and, and pivotal. But on the notion of, of language, I also want to be respectful to the listeners, right? Um, and maybe set, set some terms out and please. maybe some context of terms of please. what does transgender actually mean? What does cisgender mean? Please. And so, please. so transgender is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity or expression is different than cultural expectations based on the sex they were assigned at birth. And, and so it can, but doesn't always include people who identify as non-binary, gender queer. They, they, don't, they don't leverage the, the binary male versus female as like one that they want to identify with, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it's interesting because even in the trans community, there isn't total agreement on the terminology. In our, in our research, we, we spoke to so many individuals, we surveyed a bunch of people. One of our survey respondents actually told us, I don't know if I'm ready to be anything more than just a little queer. And they feel that even in the LGBTQ community, if you're not fully transitioning, if you are not, you know, in route for a medical procedure, if you're not on certain medications, you're not always viewed as really trans. And so in our research, we refer to trans folks that um, folks who do not identify with the sex they were assigned at birth, um, including those who are binary, gender nonconforming. And cisgender folks are folks that are not transgender and they're not um, non-binary. Ho hopefully that clears up both the brilliant language point that you brought up and then also gives folks that are tuning in a bit more context into, into what we're talking about. Mm. Yeah, it's just so interesting to think about... Um... I think about the journey of, of even, you know, black folks in this, in this country and the journey around naming and how there's always been a power struggle between what the system, whatever repressive experience it is, frankly, um, um, has placed upon the shoulders of the oppressed, right? And the power struggle to kind of reclaim naming, 
right? So I think about, you know, I, my grandmother raised me in like, I'm, I'm the old soul. So my grandmother raised me to think about, you know, James Brown, you know, coming out and saying I'm black and I'm proud and how, you know, black then became, which was once a term used to categorize an entire population, became the political identity for an entire community, et cetera. And so it's really interesting and it's continued to be a journey for especially the black community, but frankly, also the Latinx community. And so I think about the, it's like, if there's always this interesting dynamic as a community has come to, as a, as a community's experience, become, you know, moves from the margins to the center, this struggle for identity, right? Um, and and how it, it's almost not natural for us to have to kind of put ourselves in a box or name ourselves. But as we take back power, right, the importance of going from categorization, right, to a political identity or to an expression. So I just find it very interesting, this power struggle that often marginalized communities face with having to put themselves in a place, right, um, first by systemic expectations, but then this movement towards um, being more of a political identity. And I think that we're seeing, especially amongst our trans siblings, um, that both the, the umbrella term trans not only is, is, is an identity and an experience by which we move through this world, but also one that has become a political identity as well, similar to many of our black siblings. So yeah. very interesting. Um, okay, cool. So I know you're about to set the stage for findings, and this is, I think, a good intro into them. Yeah. So um, there is so much that came out of our report. Um, yeah. And so I can talk about the report for days. But when I... When I boil it down to, to me, the most defining finding or learning or statistic from the study, it was, it was everything that was anchored in safety. And safety yeah. was a massive theme for this report. And I, came, and I think it came to, got together pretty, pretty beautifully. Um, whereas most populations strive to feel included in the workplace, yeah. right? The I and DEI. Transgender folks strive to feel safe. And, yeah. and when I say safe, I mean physical, mental, emotional violence. Yeah. Um, safety at 60, close to 60%, I think it was 59%, was by far the most cited concern for yeah. trans folks in their decisions to pursue industries or not. So this is, yeah. you know, I've graduated whether it be high school, college, technical school, whatever school they were a part of, and they were applying to jobs, um, they had to make a very deliberate decision. I will not go into X industry or I will go into Y industry because I feel more safe, because I know yeah. that I will be safe. Um, sure. and, and outside of safety, not seeing others like them in industries, not being able to bring their, their true self to work, um, not finding support for trans or gender nonconforming people um, are yeah. also on that list. But I feel like they all come back to this notion of, will I feel safe? Is there a point yeah. in, in my day, my work week, my year at this organization or this industry where that might be at conflict, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then that also leads mm -hmm. into some other stats of, them not being able to bring their true self to work every day. And so for me personally, like when I, when I looked at this data, I was like, this, this resonates, right? In my day-to-day yeah. -day at McKinsey, when I, when I was an analyst and a, and a manager and I was given projects to choose between, like some of those decisions were, will I feel safe flying to X city or being right. in X state? Right. Um, yep. Should I go to a team dinner in this part of town um, yep. and, and all of that, I had to weigh all of those options, but I had to weigh that internally, right? It wasn't right, necessarily right. something I was going to problem solve with somebody else. And so I think in many cases, like it was in the report, fantastic. And it was backed by data, but these are lived experiences by so many That's people, right. both across the U S and, and globally. Oh, yeah. I mean, just. First of all, thank you for bringing that to life, not only through your own personal experiences, but also um, through the report itself. And it, and, and it stuck with me. Um, so I want to I want to stay on this point for a moment and then, you know, we, we can dive into some practices afterwards. But there's like two things that come top of mind. So the first is around. Um, 
remote work. And I think that we've been talking a lot um, as HR professionals, as people and talent leaders about, you know, whether or not remote work has actually made it easier for folks to feel safe, to feel like they can belong. Has it been the great equalizer or hasn't it? And I'm curious your thoughts there, because I think that, you know, I mean, truly, I mean, you can hold multiple truths at the same time in this point. But generally, I think that, yeah, we are seeing actually like a rise in mental health crises and struggles um, compounded by organizations that don't have resources, right, support folks' mental health, et cetera, also in the report um, and others. And so I'm just curious, like, what are your reflections? You know, global global community that is McKinsey, um, you know, this research is is built on the back of multiple industries. But you imagine that in tech, right, there's this bit, this been the skewed privilege of being able to kind of work remotely or, or work from home. And I'm curious if this idea of safety has been impacted both in a net positive way or a net negative way by remote work in the, in, in the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I will not give you, give you, give you the straight answer. Cause I don't think there is one. Um, exactly. And so in, in some ways this remote situation, and I know, I know many organizations have, pushed all of their employees to go back in person. Some are in a hybrid model, some are still in a remote model. But in in many instances, remote work and this ability to turn off your camera or just dial on to Zoom or Teams or Google Meet with just audio or being able to dial on from your phone um, worked wonders for, for certain folks in the trans community. Those that were actively going through a medical transition those that right. needed convenience to meet with their mental health professional or therapist, right? And so right. in some cases, you know, trans fo- folks joined new organizations during the pandemic, didn't need to, didn't, didn't feel the need to come out prior to their medical right. transition. And so, so remote work actually was, was quite beneficial for some individuals, which was fantastic. Being able to go through this medical transition without feeling the need to come out to new colleagues or to new clients and having the protection, I'll say, of a remote model, we, we heard from many trans folks who said this was this was a blessing in disguise, right? Right. Um, right. And and that made me very, very happy for them. Um, that we flipped the coin to regardless of, of if you're transitioning, regardless of if you're at a new organization, but remote work forced individuals to stay in environments that may not have been the healthiest. And so whether that be the family that, you know, many people moved back with their family, right? Um, Many people lost jobs and so either had to do that or did that for convenience. Um, That might not be the most healthy environment, right? Or, you know, perhaps in some cases, trans, gender nonconforming folks Work was a safe haven. It was an escape from the, whether it be city, community, the town that they lived in that was not inclusive, right? But yeah. but for very deliberate reasons, they had to live there. And so in some cases, you know, going back to the point that you, that you raised earlier of, you know, we've seen a lot more focus on mental health during the pandemic right. because there's been concern around that, right? And so in, in many cases, what we heard from both people in, via the survey, um, the interviews that we did, but also my friends in the community, yeah. um, it forced them to be in this toxic environment for far longer than they wished to, mm-hmm. right? That eight hour day, that 12 hour work day was actually the escape that they needed um, mm-hmm. from their from their daily life, if that makes sense. It does one hundred percent. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, okay, my the next point that I want to anchor around this is for, frankly, the organizations who are still remote or the organizations um, that are that are in person. Really doesn't matter. Um, you know, last year I think, well, really it was in twenty twenty. We can call it twenty twenty one as well. When we started to see a rise of this racial equity move, movement that was impacting kind of Silicon Valley, but industries across the board and folks were looking to deploy solutions, there were a camp of organizations that said, nah, right? Like this, this type of, you know, political culture, the politics, et cetera, right? Don't belong in the workplace. And I think that, you know, 
um, the struggle towards marginalized communities moving closer to the center is an arc that you know stretches very long. So we're we've ne we're now ten times more uh, comfortable talking about uh, you know Women's History Month as an example, um, with with frankly cisgendered men, women in mind, right? Cisgendered white women in mind um, than we are now. Uh, you know, or we were in a better place now than we were before, and so. Um, and I think the same thing, I think the same thing, frankly, with, with racial equity, right? Like, I think that we're, we're making some progress towards having some comfort in welcoming these type of conversations into the workplace. Um, I, 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 I know, we know that the same is not true for many of our trans siblings who often are, first of all, are just fighting for political agency, right? And, and legal protection in the U S right now, let alone the globe. Right. Um, and so my question is like, what do you say to those employers who think that the experience, who can embrace this journey towards cisgendered um, equality, who can embrace or starting to embrace this journey of racial equality is not seeing it as being political, right? But then when we see the trans experience, right? Oh, well, that's just too political, right? We're going to keep politics out of the workplace where the, the bathrooms are they are, are what they are. Use the bathroom for which you were assigned at, at birth, et cetera. But just help me understand kind of like, um, what do you say to those organizations, right? What are they missing out on? You know, we talk about some of the economics of this, um, especially one of the most competitive talent landscapes that we've seen in decades. Um, what do we say to those organizations? Yeah. Um, and so, and in many cases, we, we tend to, organizations tend to hide behind, oh, well, like, you know, whether it be the trans experience is too political or, you know, I, I don't have enough understanding. I think yeah. the nice thing about the report is that we provided an understanding, which is great. And so now I don't think organizations have an excuse to say, well, we don't understand the trans experience. And so mm. I, I take this back to, if you had a business unit at your organization and it was not performing and it was the only one underperforming, you'd likely do a diagnostic and figure out That's why right. they, why, why you aren't performing. And then you change the things that forced it to underperform. Right. And so that's what we try to do with our report. Like what, what are trans people feeling in the workplace today and how can organizations leverage this? And so but before, before we came on the podcast, I know you had a couple of questions for me on, Hey, help me understand job application. Help me understand work exclusion. Help me understand advancement barriers. And so, if 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 I may, I'd love to just spend a bit no, more time. No, I think that's the perfect so, transition. You're the best co-host ever. Thank you. Lovely. So, um, so let's start with with the trans experience even before you're in the workplace, right? That's right. You either finish school or are transitioning jobs, or or for whatever reason you are applying, right? Um, Trans workers are migrating to jobs where they feel safe. Um, right. In many of these cases, where they feel safe tend to exclude lucrative professions. Um, mm -hmm. And it excludes actually fully participating in the economy. So we'll, we'll, we'll see like a spike in part-time jobs versus full-time jobs when we look at trans mm -hmm. versus the cisgender experience. And what we found through this, through the application process is that trans folks are 1.5 times less likely to be their full selves when they're applying to a job. And mm. during the interview process, they are 1.3 times less likely to be their full selves. So even before these trans folks accept an offer, are at their desk, walk into a door, they mm. are already not their true authentic self. And as if I'm an employer, I, I definitely want someone to, to showcase their true authentic self to me because I want to know this person, right? I'm hiring mm -hmm. them for this job. And so, so many, in so many application processes and interview processes, we have not really thought about the trans experience, right? Yeah. Should I ask about pronouns? Should I make that required or not? Should I ask for a legal name or a preferred name? To, yeah. to nuance towards, you know, how do we ensure that everyone feels included um, mm -hmm. throughout, throughout the process? Um, mm -hmm. And that, that, that sort of transitions into when they're actually at work, right? So applications done, interviews done, stellar candidate, and organizations want to hire this person. Um, 
we find that trans folks feel entirely excluded. And so yeah. through, through our research, we found that close to 60% don't talk in meetings and close to Ooh. 40% generally avoid colleagues. So there is no sense of community, right? For, for yeah. many of these trans employees. Um, we also found that trans employees were 2.5 times less likely um, to bring their true, authentic, full self to work than cisgender mm -hmm. employees. 2.5 times is an incredibly high number for just bringing your true self to work every day. Um, just show it up. I'm just showing up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. and and on this on this note of just showing up, which um, I know that wasn't planned, but that was an amazing segue. Was was the last stat I was going to give on? Trans folks are three times more likely than cis folks to delay or skip meetings. And so, you know, when we think about feeling included at work, the system is not allowing for inclusion, right? And as we think about how am I going to, you know, create an environment for this poor performing BU, right? Business unit or group or whatever it is, you're going to fix those things, right? And so, for, and, and I bring that analogy to inclusion, right? Tr your trans colleagues are likely not feeling excluded today. Fix the things that make them feel excluded. Um, yes. In a nutshell, but I can talk about the report forever. But those are those are just a few on on inclusion and application, which I think are some of the first things that organizations need to really think about. Yeah. No. I mean, I. I, yes, right. And as a talent organization that's building a marketplace, you know, we keep this very top of mind because, you know, the different customers that we're serving are on variant journeys here. And how do you build a workplace for someone, um, even if you don't know if you have a member of that community represented in your workforce, right? And so that, that's building with like a negative day one experience. How can the first co-founder on day negative one shape an organization that um, is healthy, welcoming, safe for everyone, right? As opposed to kind of just building from the center outwards. What if we build from the margins inward? So I really appreciate that reflection. Um, and I think that folks, we, we focus so much on inclusion in the workplace, right? And honestly, haven't made too many strides, but we forget about the fact that just attracting folks to this building um, is, is a challenge in itself. So if we know where folks, if we know some of the challenges and some of the stats that you've um, that you've kind of brought to the surface around just simply attracting talent, engaging talent, then what are the solutions, right? What can companies do today? We're a talent marketplace, so obviously we love talking about recruiting. What can companies do today, right, especially with our listeners, that can begin to reverse some of that harm um, that exists in the process? Yeah. Um, so a, a couple of things, right? Um, and I urge you know, organization leaders that are listening to this to, to try and not, not pick and choose. This is not an a la carte menu, right? It is, yeah. you have to, you have to go all in, right? Um, think about it as right. a, like an all tasting buffet, right? We are, we are going in. Um, and so the, the first thing is to your point, right? The beginning of the funnel, we need to be intentional with recruiting, um, mm. connect with potential new hires. What, what, what do trans folks want to see, right? Um, you yeah. can actually, companies can participate in recruiting events tailored to the trans community. Those exist today, right? And it doesn't take yeah. more than a Google search or two to find those recruitment events, those career fairs, which have trans gender non-conforming folks um, flocking to them because they feel included, right? So the first one is be intentional with recruiting. The second is really think about what supports your organization has for, yeah. for trans folks, right? Um, and I will say, you know, over the last couple of decades, HR teams, purpose teams have grown the benefits, not, not necessarily for the trans community, but for women, for people of color. And, and I have, I love to see it, right? And so, yeah. The second thing is offer trans-affirming benefits. HR teams, mm -hmm. your purpose teams, your legal teams can be prepared to show up as allies um, to make sure that your organization has benefits like mental health care support, um, gender affirmative surgery, 
hormone therapy, right? Mm. Um, mm. And the reality is, you know, so many of these insurance organizations are having these conversations. So it's not net new, right? Um, and these options are, are definitely available. Third um, is really thinking about the policies and programs at play, right? Um, and I, I, I tell all of my clients, right? So much has changed during COVID. Um, have you changed the way that you review your employees? And they say no. Have you changed the way that you recruit? And they say no. And so I, I look at organizations that want to create trans inclusive environments. And I say, let's look back at the dress code, review the company dress code, eliminate gender specific yeah. language. Um, Make sure that all of your diversity trainings, which some organizations have only recently started implementing, actually have language that's nuanced to the mm. trans and gender non-conforming experience. And then I think the last thing that I'll say is how are you creating an inclusive culture, right? Uh, sure. Personal pronouns. And you don't need to make them required, but showcasing that if someone wants to share their pronouns, there's a space for them to do that. Right. Sure, um, sure. Preferred names, uh, gender neutral bathrooms. Right. And so th those are just sort of four big buckets that, that I articulated. Yeah. But I think if I gave any more, it would be too daunting. But I think those with those four, we can start to yeah. to be on this path towards inclusion for for our trans colleagues or gender nonconforming colleagues, um, which I think is a fantastic start. Yeah, David, I mean, I feel like we could have spent um, a really long time together, my friend, uh, and, I, and I can't wait to, to, um, to, to share this message with the world, but also to have you back um, so we can talk about progress. So I want to I wanna end on a message, and I think that as we do with all of our, our podcast guests, you know, we, we, we often allow or create space for folks to just kind of share what their message is for the world. And so I want to invite you to kind of do the same as you, as you paint in the way you already have. And I mean, I just can't wait to follow you. I'd follow you into any battle you want me to. Um, as you paint your picture of what the world might look like or what it could look like, as you call, you know, our various communities to kind of actualize into who they're meant to be, et cetera. Um, what e either share a message about how you imagine, we'll just keep it in the U.S. context for now. Like, how do you imagine the, this community revol evolving or share a message to our, our trans siblings who may be listening to this, share a message to our HR teams and our CEOs who may be listening in. But this is really a moment to kind of close out the podcast and, and really share what, our, what, what, what the potential of our future could look like with, with anyone who may be listening. Yeah. And I'll, I'll try to keep it simple because my, my thoughts are racing because it's a, such a good question, but um Safety shouldn't be a reason not to, right? Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Like I want, I want to wake up as a biracial trans femme individual and not make decisions based on safety because, because it's safe to do everything, right? For the, for, for my entire life, I've had to make that decision of like going someplace, doing something, eating at this restaurant. And so, I'd love to, I love to be in a state of the world where safety is not a reason not to. Oh, well, David, um, my friend, until next time, uh, thank you so much for sharing. We could have literally gone forever. So thank you so much for, for making this work approachable and accessible, um, for doing the good work um, in a time that's been really scary for a number of communities, especially in the last four years. But um, Kind of standing in your truth and um, being resilient to, you know, um, make real, make tangible what a world could look like where um, folks feel safe and where folks have space to actualize. So um, I appreciate you and um, I can't wait to see you again. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to chat with you today.